Good afternoon, everyone. This is the last of our sessions this spring, and we'll come again in the fall as our project continues. As those of you who know who've been here for earlier sessions, we're convinced that we are, as a world, on a hinge of history. We're trying to explore how the various reasons for that hit different countries and also uh, create problems for different aspects of our community. This time we're talking about governance and it's a major issue. So uh, that's our program for today. And the person in chairing it is Deborah Gordon, who is the director executive director of the Pre Preventive Defense Project, with which she works closely with Secretary of former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. I might say Bill Perry is one of the greatest people around and was a wonderful Secretary of Defense. And she's, she combines that kind of thing with having been mayor of Woodside. She's retired from that post, but the, problem, the fact that she was there makes it clear that you know something about governance. So, Deborah, take over. Thank you very much, George. I'm delighted to be here and to see all of you here. I'm looking forward to your questions. All, mostly they are looking forward to your questions. I'm uh, looking forward to their answers. I will briefly introduce them. You have uh, their papers in your booklets. Um, we have one uh, presenter who was uh, with us this all day, uh, who is on the East Coast and will not be presenting um, for this afternoon, but he is, his paper is in the, in the booklet and I encourage you to read it. It was absolutely fascinating. We have a mix of disciplines. We have uh, practitioners, we have scholars, um, all different points of view. So I encourage you to ask tough questions and I know if the students are here, they will ask tough questions. We'll start with Jack Goldstone. He is the Virginia E. and John T. Hazel, Jr. Uh, Chair Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University and a Global Fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Next to him, to his left, is Larry Diamond. He is a Senior Fellow here at Hoover, at the Hoover Institution and at the Freeman Spogli Institute. He is one of the driving forces of CDDRL, the Center for uh, <laughs> Center for the uh, Democracy, the Development, and the Rule of Law. I have to get those right. It, CDDRL is, runs, rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> and uh, then next we will have Alice Hill, who is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution on both coasts in Washington and here at Stanford on the West Coast. Uh, before coming to Hoover, she uh, served in the Obama administration as a special assistant to the president and senior director for resilience policy on the National Security Council. She's also served as a judge. She's a practitioner and a scholar as well. Uh, and then we have um, Morris or Mo Fiorina. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Wendt Family Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. And I look forward to uh, hearing all of your brief uh, statements on uh, the discussions that we had earlier today. I'm gonna ask them to do five, eight minutes of uh, a summary of what we just talked about, and then I will ask them a couple of questions to get their conversation going, and uh, during that time, uh, or while they're speaking, I ask you to think about what you would like to ask, and there are two microphones, on one on each aisle, and I will look for your hands and call on you. So why don't we get started, and Jack. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk about demography and governance issues. Um, we are in one of the richest, most successful societies in the world, but like other rich uh, advanced democracies, our population has been getting older, and our workforce is not growing as it once was. After World War II, all the rich advanced democracies had rapid population growth, uh, that fueled the economies. But in the last quarter of the 20th century, and then especially for the last 20 years, we've relied more on immigration as our uh, population, native-born population growth rate has diminished. Now, the result of that 
has been a big increase in diversity, not only in uh, where people are coming from, <clears throat> but in the numbers. So that from the United, for the United States, uh, we shifted from a country where most immigrants came from Europe to a country where most of our immigrant population has come first from Latin America, and then recently, uh, more increasingly so, from Asia and even Africa. Uh, in Europe, uh, immigration was very minimal until the 1980s, uh, but then larger, larger numbers of people, especially from Eastern Europe, especially with the expansion of the European Union, uh, and then people from outside the European Union, Ukraine, Russia, uh, poured into Western Europe. So both Western Europe and the United States have both had larger and more diverse immigration streams for the past few decades, and recently have been hit hard by unexpected surges of immigration in the US from Central America, in Europe from uh, the Middle East, particularly Syria. And the consequences of this for governance have been quite substantial. Democracy relies on a certain amount of trust and consensus, both within the population and between the population and government. And the change in the composition of population has had a bracing and often negative effect on that. So the suspicion, anxiety about changing values, what will happen with more foreigners, uh, at the extreme, uh, people in Germany and France worry about what happens if their country uh, is overtaken by Muslims. Uh, here we worry about what happens when the white uh, Christian majority becomes a minority of the population, population in the United States. And these anxieties have led to the growth of nationalist political parties, anti-immigration political parties, anti-immigration leaders, and that has really shaken up our politics. Now that would be fine if we continue to be constructive and work toward rational solutions to these issues, uh, but that has not happened. Rather, it seems that fear and anxiety is driving policy. And meanwhile, outside our borders, the combination of continued rapid population growth, climate change, and poor governance is leaving more and more people from developing countries looking to move to the greater opportunities in Europe and the United States. So right now, we are in kind of a constant battle. Instead of being able to manage migration like a healthy flow of water in an irrigated farm, we are caught between a desire to shut the valve off entirely or the fear that it will be broken and opened and we'll have a flood that we don't want. So our difficulty, at least with regard to demography, is how to combine the reasonable goals of people in the developing world to improve their economies, but also to take advantage of opportunities in the rich world. Join that with the rich world's true need to have a certain degree of immigration to cope with the shrinking and aging workforce that we have. So these goals should be in concert. And this is one of those occasions where the old saying, you know, build bridges, not walls, is a reasonable solution, but it requires coordination and good governance on both sides and trust within both societies in order to make progress. Uh, when we have a situation where the rich democracies are fearful, anxious about immigrants, want to close themselves off, and when leaders of developing countries worry about imperialist policies and threats to them from efforts to uh, bring family planning to the developing world, we get nowhere. So I'm happy to open discussion to ideas about how to uh, improve trust and governance on both sides. Larry? Okay, uh, well, um, Jack and I have co-authored a paper, so um, I'll offer some policy implications from it. Uh, let me begin by saying that um, having been in most of these sessions over 11 months, I, I think that uh, one of the most striking uh, features of our uh, deliberations uh, has been this uh, astonishing set of demographic uh, uh, revolutions that is uh, sweeping the world. Um, 
the, uh, uh, just to take off exactly from where Jack left off, um, the dramatic uh, declines uh, in fertility in the advanced industrial democracies generating societies which, as uh, Jack said today in our roundtable, um, for which there is no precedent in human history in terms of the extent to which they're aging and the extent to which um, they will need immigration of young workers to stay creative and vital, to keep up improvements in productivity, and to just uh, provide the health care and support services that will be needed uh, for an aging population. And at the same time, while many so-called developing or emerging market uh, countries are going through the demographic transition to lower fertility rates, we're still seeing really astonishingly high uh, fertility rates in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and some other very large um, uh, uh, emerging market countries in uh, Asia and the Middle East. Uh, so um, uh, Europe, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the United States, uh, uh, Australia, we're going to need more people. Uh, more young people in order to remain creative and vital and uh, to have a uh, ratio of young workers to retirees that is fiscally sub sustainable. Certain countries in the world are going to have uh, a large uh, surplus of people because of uh, rapid population growth rates. So if we can manage this, there's a great opportunity for complementarity uh, and for the whole world moving toward what has been the unique founding miracle of the United States, which is e pluribus unum, out of many, one. One kind of country of many races, many religions, many ethnicities, many national origins, but assimilating into a common liberal democratic uh, creed of uh, you know, shared civic attachment and conviction. That's the vision. Uh, if we can retain it in the United States and if other advanced industrial democracies, particularly in Europe, that have no history of, of this kind of uh, assimilation and multinational uh, common civic democratic creed can, can put this together. But there's every possibility that this could go in the age of illiberal populism and under other stresses uh, that we know about of the climate change variety that Alice is going to talk about, of globalization and the many technological and other disruptions that we've been talking about in this remarkable project, there's also pretty significant scope for this to go very badly, both for the substantive challenges we need to meet and for the challenge of maintaining the quality and commitment to uh, liberal democracy. So let me articulate um, some general uh, kind of policy implications. One is I offer uh, uh, from our joint paper uh, as a scholar, really a pair of scholars who've been studying political, economic, and social development for several decades. And I think anyone who does is just struck by the obvious um, lesson uh, that if you don't have at least decent levels of governance, of rule of law, control of corruption, uh, concern for the generation of public goods for health care, education, uh, and other needs of a society rather than the private goods that corrupt elites generate, uh, accumulate, and largely send abroad to be laundered and stashed uh, in uh, rich countries around the world. If you don't have that, it's hard to get sustainable economic growth. If you don't get sustainable economic growth and if you don't target it in ways uh, that we know bring about declines in fertility, uh, such as investments in education, particularly the education of women, the generation of jobs, particularly for women who are entering um, uh, working age, public health, sanitation, uh, particularly public health on infant, maternal, and, and child um, health, access to birth control. Uh, we know these things bring about declines in fertility. But if you, if you have good governance, you can generate 
the public investments that bring about these things. If what you have is bad governance, a political closure, uh, predatory governance and authoritarianism, what you're going to get is a different set of prescriptions that are not going to lead to these kinds of public investments, but rather to, at, at best, chronically bad governance um, and high fertility rates of people who are trying to adapt to it to ensure against this insecurity in their old age, and at worst, state failure, massive flows of refugees, and so on and so forth. The consequences for our foreign aid policy are, first of all, um, that we need to accelerate, not diminish, the kinds of governance assistance that will improve the rule of law, uh, strengthen democratic and responsible policing, combat violent crime, and generate both the uh, demand side of civic mobilization for rule of law, transparency, good governance, control of corruption, and the supply side in terms of a state that's moving in this direction of transparency and better governance. And increasingly, our foreign aid should be organized uh, around these principles and around the priority investments, I repeat, in, the in raising levels of education, particularly of girls, maternal, infant, and child health care expanded family planning and the kind of decentralized delivery of these things which Jack and his study of Bangladesh has found have brought about pretty impressive uh, uh, transformations in what was once thought to be a basket case, um, uh, but is now a country that's moving toward uh, dramatically lower fertility, pretty decent uh, economic growth, and so on. The implications for immigration policy, I think, point to the possibility in the United States of a grand bargain on immigration policy if we could fix our politics, which Mo is going to explain to us how we can do in a few minutes. Right, Mo? Um, so that we could once again, going to fix it all. <laughs> once again, be able to, you know, transcend partisanship and get balanced compromises. A balanced compromise would recognize that, yeah, any state needs to have control of its borders. And you can't just have indiscriminate, uncontrolled immigration from anywhere and have a society stand for that. A balanced policy would recognize, if it looks historically, that at the various points in its history, when the United States has reached its peak uh, percentages of uh, foreign-born citizens, which is about 14 or 15 percent, which is about where we're at now. Uh, foreign-born is a percent of the total population. We have had nativist, illiberal, populist, racist, anti-immigrant movements. You can just track the rise of these movements with spikes in immigration. This does not mean stop immigration. I don't even think it it means productively build a wall, but it does mean a, a slowdown or a pause so that we can absorb the immigration spurts that we have had. And it does mean that we have to get back to an emphasis on a common identity, a common creed, uh, assimilation, not the surrender of a national origin and, and, and so on that you might feel great and legitimate pride in, but assimilation into a common American identity and identification with our unique liberal uh, democracy. Um, uh, within immigration policy, I think the logic of many of the presentations that have been made over these roundtables suggests prioritizing immigration of high-skilled workers. Uh, and you know, as we've said in a previous session, if we get the best and the brightest coming from around the world and getting uh, masters and PhDs here in science, engineering, and other technical fields. Let's keep them here and give them long-term visas to contribute to our own uh, economic uh, growth and welfare. I think it should be possible to get to this kind of compromise bargain, uh, but we're not going to do it in the kind of uh, slash and burn, uh, uh, zero-sum, uh, highly polarized politics that we have today. Thank you, Larry. We're going to move to Alice now. And
she's going to uh, talk to us a bit about climate change uh, in as a cause of some of these population flows that that we have been hearing about, not generally all about climate change and the infrastructure required to support that. Thank you. So I will be uh, focusing on climate change, but there are really two big uh, issues when it comes to climate change. The one may be more familiar to you, which is mitigation of our emissions, the Paris Agreement, uh, World Agreement on how to do that. The other is a very local problem. Uh, it doesn't require global agreement. It actually requires local agreement on how to deal with the impacts of climate change. And if a country or a local government does not deal with the climate impacts, uh, then we can get migration pressures uh, on a level that could be unprecedented, according to our National Intelligence Council. So, it used to be we thought that climate change was a problem for 2100. Uh, I don't think anyone who lives in California could believe that uh, anymore, having witnessed the two worst wildfire seasons in recorded history, uh, two most expensive seasons in terms of loss of life and uh, as well as expense. So what do we do to prepare for these impacts? Climate change honors no jurisdictional boundaries. It's gonna cut across a county line, a city line, a state line, and a country line, and it could be one event doing all of those uh, line crossings. But of course, we are govern ourselves based on those lines. We have around San Francisco Bay, 100 municipalities who have to agree on what they do with sea level rise in the Bay. This has proven they have made great progress. They're ahead of many other jurisdictions in the United States, but we still haven't come to an agreement as to even what we can expect with sea level rise or what's happening. We've already had over a half a foot of sea level rise, and that begins to cause you flooding problems because virtually all of our built environment Every decision, and I'm pretty confident that's true of Stanford right now, for what these buildings look like, how they're constructed, depended on a historical understanding of what the extremes were in the past. History is no longer a safe guide for us as we make decisions about our built environment. Particularly important are the decisions of where we live, and how we build. If you're looking at economic loss, our investments in infrastructure that do not reflect future risk, and there are plenty of examples. Your Oakland Bay Bridge, uh, San uh, State of California decided to ignore sea level rise. You already need $17 million of remediation for flooding from sea level rise as you enter those toll booths. You can go to pretty much uh, any community and find long-lived infrastructure that is not up to the job. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers rates our infrastructure a D plus because it's aging. And then on top of that, so none of that infrastructure accounts for these future risks that are coming quickly, drought, wildfire, increased storm, higher wind, uh, extreme precipitation like you see in Houston. So those decisions to pave over roads, no place for all that rain to fall. And by the way, those rain events, they're so extreme, 50 inches in a short amount of time, very difficult to deal with that much water falling. But when you have imperial pavements and decisions to have small culverts, it's gonna flood and it will continue to flood. So what do we do about that? That's really the issue. And are we going to tell people they can't build in places that are likely to burn? This is a real question in California right now. Governor Newsom has said no, he won't do that. Australia reached an entirely different conclusion after they suffered terrible fires in 2009. They said in the state of Victoria, we are not going to allow this. Uh, we are going to put severe restrictions on building in areas that burn. 
I don't have the answers. I think the question is how will we find the political will to reach agreement among ourselves as to how to keep ourselves safe. Because when we decide to build in unsafe places, we put each other at risk. And that puts the firefighter who has to put out the fire. It puts uh, all of the other adjoining uh, uh, wildlands at risk because more humans in areas of uh, wildlands creates more ignition. Similarly, uh, if we require in flooded areas where we know there'll be continuing flooding to put our infrastructure there, uh, those investments may be gone. So uh, there are a number of risks that we identified today. Our current built environment based on assumptions of the past. So we'll see a lot of failures in our current, what we have already existing. What we're putting up new, we do not have building standards. Uh, this is true in the United States, it's true globally, that reflect the future risk from climate change. So you could have a bridge that's being built but does not account for extreme precipitation that we know will cause the bridge to fail if it were considered or could not be adjusted to be higher as we see more sea level rise. We do not have good mechanisms yet for this inter-jurisdiction uh, inter uh, planning. Uh, really struggling uh, in our major uh, water basins as well as here in the United States to make those decisions. And we do not understand how interconnected, which is another challenge that climate change greatly stresses, of our, inter our infrastructure systems. So as we saw in Sandy, if the electrical grid fails, it brings down all the other sectors. So uh, what are the roles? These are state and local decisions. These are made right here in your own community uh, as to how you build. And that's uh, the way our constitution, we left this up to the states and they often delegate it to the local communities. Uh, but the question is, what is the role of the federal government? Uh, and one guiding principle, I think, when you're talking about federal taxpayers that if a local jurisdiction decides they don't want to take invest, and that's what essentially Houston said, they said we don't want to invest in flood prevention, that was before Harvey. If a community decides that, then should we as federal taxpayers be rewarding that decision when the bad event occurs? I think it should be fundamental that uh, any taxpayer dollars are spent, are spent wisely. And for me, that means that it's spent in a way that shows communities are working to make those local decisions that will make them resilient in face of these accelerating impacts. I would just leave you with uh, that this isn't an abstract issue. Uh, you've seen it across California, we're seeing it across the United States. Our losses are at unprecedented levels. 2008, uh, excuse me, 2017, $300 billion of losses in the United States. Insured losses worldwide in 2018 hit the highest level ever. Reasons for that were more people, were more wealthy, uh, but it will, these will mount. They will cost the federal government ever more money. And our, my hope is that we can help local communities uh, begin to make the right decision. Today, we heard a lot about the Federalist page, uh, Papers, about uh, the founders of our democracy, what they thought about as they tried to establish a system that's durable and responsive and governs us well. And as I heard that, I remembered a saying of Benjamin Franklin uh, that I think is particularly apt as we face these very challenging events that will uh, tax all of us uh, in terms of loss of life and loss of prosperity. And that is, he said, by failing to prepare, you were preparing to fail. Mm -hmm. And at this point, because we are not having frank discussions about the land use choices that we are making here in the United States, we are setting ourselves up at great risk of failure. Thank you.
We're going to move on now to, uh, to Mo Mofi Arena, and uh, he's, uh, I'm going to, I said this earlier today to the entire group. During their talks and our discussions, his name kept coming up as, well, Mo will give us the answers. <laughs> so I, I have to say, I didn't quite hear all of the answers. We did not deliver either, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. But I'm going to ask you to try. Okay. I was tasked with writing about uh, democratic governance, and that's a subject that a lot of people are pessimistic about today. Here are some observations. The vague and persistent feeling that democracies have become ungovernable has been growing steadily in Western Europe. The case of Britain has become the most dramatic example of this malaise. Western Europe has only 20 or 30 more years of democracy left in it. The United States, given the relative decline in its military, economic, and political influence, the United States is more likely to face serious military or diplomatic reversal during the coming years than at any previous time in its history. This does occur, it could pose a traumatic shock to American democracy. Actually, that's uh, fake news. Uh, those uh, comments, and many like them, are taken from this book, which was published in 1975. Okay. Yeah, so we've been there before, and what's interesting is that 20 years after this book was published, uh, we were in the 90s, and this was an era in which political scientists uh, called it the era of petty politics. Uh, we complained that presidential candidates talked about things like V-chips and school uniforms. And Bill Clinton complained that you couldn't be a great president if you didn't have great challenges, and there weren't any great challenges out there. So I thought it'd be an interesting exercise to go back and look at what were the problems, what was the crisis these people saw then, uh, what did they see as the causes, and how did we get out of it by the 90s, and seeing if there are <coughs> any parallels or any lessons to be learned. And I think actually there were quite a few. The, um, the uh, nature of the, uh, the problem they saw is fourfold. Uh, the disintegration of social order, uh, the breakdown of social discipline, the debility of leaders, and the alienation of citizens. Now, when it comes to the breakdown of social order, we naturally think of things like the, the yellow vests in France, for example. And there's a lot of instances of incivility and sort of nasty behavior. But it's really nice to see so many gray hairs in this audience because you remember the 60s. And things were a lot worse. Uh, we had major race riots in our cities. Hundreds of people were killed, thousands injured. Federal troops patrolling nearly all our major cities at one time or another. Uh, we had at the Democratic National Convention the anti-war demonstrations. Uh, over 500 protesters received medical treatment. Uh, four students were shot and killed at Kent State University. Uh, Paris, uh, France was on the verge of either revolution or military coup. Uh, De Gaulle fled to a military base in Germany temporarily. In Italy, the Red Brigades uh, kidnapped a former prime minister and murdered him. Uh, things, were, things were very nasty, and yet somehow we, we came out of that. Things are not nearly that bad today. On the other hand, when it comes to the ability of leaders, well, um, Macron came in at 75% approval, and he's down to 35. He's 10 points lower than Trump. Um, Renzi in Italy, same thing, came in in the 70s. When he resigned, he was in the 30s. And if you followed any of the Brexit thing, watching poor uh, Theresa May try to do something with the British Parliament uh, is just another example. The alienation of citizens, that's the most documented trend in modern social science, that p citizens are just around the world in a foul mood. They don't trust their government. They don't trust basically anything uh, out there. What were the causes of these uh, pathologies? Well, the, uh, the critics at the time uh, said they were uh, basically a combination of government failure on the one hand combined with rapid social change. And you think about the government failure, of course, in the 60s, 70s, we had Vietnam, a long war with unsatisfactory conclusion, and stagflation. I mean, just the, the economy had quit growing and inflation was high. Uh, nowadays, we have, again, an unsatisfactory situation in the Middle East with war. Uh, we have an, an economy which has sort of uh, generated great inequality, the same sorts of things. And uh, you know the, the demographic changes that have been going on in the country, uh, my colleagues have talked about, they weren't quite the same in the 60s, but there was a major increase in diversity. We had a mass movement of African Americans from the South to the North, which generated increased racial diversity in the North. The Sun Belt was growing, uh, resulting in a more a different kind of South, so the geographic diversity was increasing. The women's movement, for the first time, we had men and women voting differently on some issues. Um, the uh, youth movement, just the whole generation of baby boomers hit the universities. So again, there was a lot of churn in the population, the nature of the electorate out there. So there were some parallels. And um, the, um, how do we get out of it? Uh, it's interesting. The, uh, well, I mean, the consequences, uh, we've already referred to some of them. Uh, the, the, People quit believing in authority and have said, they, they, you know, elites have been uh, 
what you call it, delegitimated, that economic elites had no answer uh, in that, those days to the uh, stagflation for a while. Today, uh, lots of problems out there. Foreign policy elites, again, if you're at war for 17 years in the Middle East, you're probably, your credibility is going to be a problem out there. And also popular elites, people who don't trust religion. There have been a lot of scandals there. They don't trust schools. They don't trust anything. The only thing that's bucking that trend is the American military. It's the one sort of positive trend upward in terms of trust and confidence. Everything else is downward. What got us out of it? Um, I was asked to write about governance and not elections, which is terrible for me because my life is elections. And, but I think elections are what got us out of it, that uh, things got actually worse after these people were writing. Uh, Britain went through, Britain became the sick man of Europe, the winner of our discontent. And then they elected Margaret Thatcher in 1979. And uh, Thatcher got a handle on inflation, uh, prosecuted the Falklands War, uh, broke the minor strike. The Conservatives governed for 17 years, 18 years in Britain. In the U.S., we elected Reagan, and Reagan, in fact, with a little help from George in foreign policy, a lot of help from Paul Volcker, uh, they broke the inflation, set on f firmer foreign policy, firmer, firmer foreign policy, and uh, for the first time since World War, since Roosevelt, uh, one party won the presidency three years in a row. Now, I'm not saying that um, we have to wait for another Lincoln or Washington to come along. And I'm also not saying we need to have neoliberal economic policies everywhere and every time. But what I'm saying is, I think what we need to break out of this situation is you, have a, you need an electorate that is ready for change, that it really realizes things aren't working right. You need parties that propose solutions that seem to make some sense. And when in office, they stick with it. And they happen to be the right solutions. If you've got the wrong ideas, it doesn't work. And a party has got to hold power long enough to actually make people think, OK, this is the way to go. And my personal view is simply we have an electorate that is ready for change. The parties are the ones who have not come through uh, on their end so far. Thank you. So I'm going to ask them uh, to uh, a few questions that I hope they will discuss amongst themselves. Um, while you all think of the wonderful questions and the difficult questions that you're going to ask them. Uh, you just gave a great history, Mo, about some of the things that uh, were going on in the 60s, which I do remember very well. Um, are, many people argue that it is really different now. You can't, you can't learn from going back and looking at the disruptions of the past and that the timing, that we all agree time is a big difference, that the velocity of change, the acceleration of change is greater than it was with, uh, around the world. And our communications are so much faster. So is it true? I mean, to a certain extent, I heard you say, just calm down, mm -hmm. just take a deep mm -hmm. breath, and it'll be OK. We'll work this out. Is that what you're saying? Uh, partly in my written remarks, I did cover my tracks a little better. <laughs> I, uh, I said that I, there is a possibility that the scale of the changes and the speed of the changes is now is simply unprecedented, and governments are simply incapable of dealing with these. That's a possibility. I, I'm sort of hoping, I'm obviously hoping that's not the case. Um, so with yeah. that, that you're, you at least brought up the possibility that current government structures aren't able to deal with it. Now we've talked about federal government, state governments, local governments, different kinds of uh, all within the same democracy of the United States at this point. We're not talking about UN or global governments, governments at this point. Is it possible, Alice, that some of these things that you brought up, the changes that need to happen at a local level to prepare us for climate change can be made by local governments? Do you see any possibility that local governments can work quickly enough to f be prepared? What has to happen? There are two ways that we've seen uh, major progress be made. The first is that a community has um, what I term a no more moment. Uh, it happened in the Netherlands in 1953. They had a terrible flood and they decided never again will we allow people to die in their sleep because of flooding. Uh, and they celebrate that or commemorate that date every, day, every year. So the citizenry is well aware of the risks that were involved. You see that in Houston after the 50 inches of rain fell, 
Houston, which had resisted building codes and resisted really uh, flood efforts to keep people out of flood prone areas, within eight months had enacted a local building code that required the homes to be elevated. And they're also looking at uh, what should be done in these highly flood, flood prone areas. They said, we can't have this happen again. So uh, take advantage of a crisis and make the appropriate changes. I think California is in that moment now with wildfires. There is a chance to really look at the development that has occurred. You have over a million homes in high fire risk zones here in California. Many uh, homes are in what we call the wildland urban interface, which are also, even if they're not in those zones, could be at risk of uh, fire. And uh, we don't yet have a building code that is truly keeps people safe in the kinds of fires that we're seeing. Those fires are worsened by drought, by dead trees, higher temperatures, uh, and they just burn bigger and um, more dangerously. So a no more moment. The other place that we've seen is uh, for local politicians who've been in power for a long time. Mayor Miami has uh, issued uh, revenue bonds uh, based on building flood uh, mitigation. Uh, I don't, I think he believes, uh, has been quoted as saying he couldn't have gotten that done earlier in his term because uh, there's a phenomenon that I've heard of as N-I-M-T. I don't know if you know what that means, Deborah, but for a politician, that means not in my term. So I'm going to fix the potholes. I'm going to pay attention to the schools. I'm going to look at crime. But I'm not going to look at that long issue of climate change that's going to require major investments added cost to add the extra protection of elevation or uh, making the bridge uh, stronger, whatever choices there are, or moving the wastewater treatment plant up the hill away from flood risk, doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, to the extent that we can help empower local politicians to feel that these decisions will not cost them their jobs, uh, we can see more action. Um, and then I do believe that uh, the federal government can provide incentives, certainly for good behavior, and uh, if uh, they could follow through, I'll also stick. So one of the interesting um, proposals that FEMA has looked at is a disaster deductible. So that means that a state that's going to want a declaration from the president that uh, a disaster has occurred and wants a lot infusion of money, that uh, they would get a lesser amount if they had not invested in reduction of risk in advance of the event. So uh, essentially, they would have a higher deductible if they chose not to invest state and local funds in making resilient choices. I don't know if there's the political will. Uh, certainly, there have been many comments to the proposal uh, to pass this, but that would push preparations to pre-event versus always looking at recovery. And we do not have good cost benefit, but for every dollar we spend, there's at least $4 saved uh, in recovery costs. So as we look forward, we need to push this uh, to pre-event. Well, I, I've heard political will a lot today <laughs> uh, or the lack and the nece necessity of having political will. Um, but I've also, through my life experiences, learned um, that that doesn't come really until, for these big issues, until something horrific happens. And we seem to start, we start we're starting to see some of these things, but we're not, we're not really there. Um, it happens in not just climate change, but nuclear weapons, a lot of things that we, we are dealing with. Um, to a certain extent, I want to push back on you two. Um, you talk about these population flows and us needing the West, the U.S., uh, and other Western countries needing the population to come support us. Um, 
that doesn't sound like a very inviting invitation to me <laughs> uh, if, I were, if I were them. Um, if you frame it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm yeah, kind of I thinking, uh, like, I, I was hearing things like sur surge protection. Like, we need to protect ourselves from the surge, not so much surge capacity and figuring out how to welcome and assimilate and give opportunities to these. I did hear a couple of times young, energetic um, young people. Uh, but there are some middle-aged people who might want to emigrate. Of course. So, um, you could you start, or you want me to? Yeah. I mean, I was struck by something that Alice said that if you um, if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And well, that was Ben, Fra ben Franklin. Ben Franklin. Well, all right. <laughs> Attributed enough. to it's Ben a, Franklin. It's, yeah. it's wise for so many things. Um, if we fail to prepare for the periodic surge of immigrants that will be produced by climate change, wars, uh, bad governance, other problems in our neighborhood, then even a small cluster of migrants can seem like a crisis. Uh, there are those who talk about the uh, arrival of several thousand unarmed women and children as tantamount to an invasion. And it is an invasion if we have no alternative except to say we need to figure out some way to stop them, we need to put them in uh, holding tents or uh, facilities, and we don't have the capacity. Uh, if we had sufficient staff of immigration judges, if we had processing facilities already established that we could activate, if we were prepared, then we could handle these things in an orderly way that would make them less frightening. But if we say, well, we don't want to prepare, uh, we don't want to deal with this, we want to pretend that uh, we can do without this, that uh, it won't happen, uh, then we are setting ourselves up for crises, failures at the border. This will not go away. Now, as it happened, we're not facing large numbers of migrants from Mexico anymore because Mexico has improved its economy, lowered its fertility, improved its governance, and so they are doing much better. They're sending us far fewer migrants. In fact, there are an awful lot of apple growers and strawberry growers and grape growers who are struggling to get enough mm -hmm. workers from south of the border to, to pick their crops, even on legal seasonal visas. We don't have a, a big problem with illegal migration from Mexico now because we've opened legal avenues for workers to get uh, temporary visas. Uh, the illegal, so-called illegal migration is not really illegal, it's unprepared. That is, asylum seekers who are trying to use international asylum laws to present themselves at the border in large numbers and say, we have a right to present ourselves. And we, we now adopted, about 40 years ago, much more of a rights-based approach to immigration issues than a labor-based or um, uh, administration-based view. Now, there may be problems with that. We signed on for international treaties. We recognize that turning away refugees uh, was not always in our best interests. Uh, in the 1960s, when we were fighting the Cold War and the United States was presenting itself as we're the land of freedom, we're the land of opportunity, decision was made to change immigration laws, which frankly had been very strongly racially biased, to say if we really mean what we say, about being a free country, about being the beacon of freedom for the world, if we mean that we're a country that's open to all people and trying to deal with conflicts of race, um, then we need to be more open on immigration. Now we're rethinking that. Uh, a lot of people are worried that, well, maybe we went too far. And that's entirely possible. We can have a conversation about limiting or adjusting. The problem is we seem to go back and forth between claims that well, we should have open borders or we should completely shut them down, both of which are irrational responses. Uh, just like saying it's, it would not be rational to try and rake all the forests in California or totally ban construction uh, within any distance of a river. Uh, you need to rationally assess what are the likely needs and assess them 
in light of a new world, a world with greater climate risks, a world with changing population, and say, what is in our benefit? And by the way, some of the things that are in our benefit also happen to be beneficial for others. Now, some people say, well, we shouldn't have more immigrants than we can absorb, but we have a population surviving into their 70s and 80s who need people to help transport them, help them sometimes get dressed, eat, manage their medication. One possibility would be to encourage our seniors uh, as not only to retire later, but to take advantage of retirement opportunities overseas. We have an enormous number of Americans who have moved to uh, Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Thailand. Peru, Thailand, because that's where low-cost labor can be found. We don't have to allow more immigrant workers to take care of our elderly if our elderly are able to relocate overseas where weather is better, medication's cheaper, and help is cheaper. The biggest obstacle to that right now is Medicare benefits are not transportable. We say Americans will pay for your health care if you're over 65, but only if you use American doctors and American hospitals. And so that kind of gets rid of the whole advantage for a lot of people of being able to move overseas and have cheaper medical care and uh, cheaper health. And a lot of them just say, well, I'll buy the local medical insurance overseas. But the other big obstacle, of course, for Americans to move overseas is if we tighten our immigration laws and say, we're not going to let people from other countries come here, they're going to reciprocate. There are an awful lot of British people who have retired to southern France and Spain who are very worried about losing their EU citizenship if their compatriots back home vote to leave. We've created a world in which there are enormous benefits from the movement of people, the movement of capital, and <clears throat> we reflexively start to shut that down because we're scared of the changes that are coming and we don't really understand them will hurt ourselves and will close off opportunities toward others. So I think a lot of the you know, issues about governance uh, have to start with the idea that everybody should have a voice, everybody should work toward a solution, but we have to recognize the change. We can't reverse the changes. We can't go back to a world in which we had a lot more young people born in this country, a lot fewer people surviving into their 70s and 80s when we were a lot less integrated with our economy with countries overseas. Uh, even if we wanted to go back there, we simply can't undo those biological realities that we created. We want people to live longer, that's great. We want women to have more control of their lives and to have the ability to plan their families. The result of that, birth rates have gone down, life expectancies have gone up. Those are realities we need to deal with and say, okay, how do we now shape our future given what we have done? The same thing for climate change, the same thing for the physical infrastructure we've built, uh, same thing for the transportation patterns we've created. It's an opportunity to create a better world for the future, it just won't look like the world we had in the past. So before Larry briefly gives his final comment, I just want to warn you, I'm going to ask for questions, so prepare yourselves. And uh, Larry. Well, I, I can be very brief. Uh, my father was an immigrant. All my grandparents were immigrants to the United States. I'm a big believer in immigration. And I think it's that Statue of Liberty and what, it sim what she symbolizes that is a big part of what makes America such a great and unique country. Um, but I think we also need to take stock of the political and social realities and the historical lessons that I was articulating before. And I can put it in a different way. Um, I think Angela Merkel has been one of the great political leaders of the last 20 years in advanced industrial democracies. But I think even she, <laughs> in an honest moment, might concede that she made a mistake for Germany and for Europe to just open the doors to Syria and another uh, immigration uh, without much kind of um, restraint or planning. And any society, I think, can only absorb so much immigration at one time 
without a backlash and without social and political stresses that might contradict and undermine the long-term goal of the kind of society you want to have and the kind of values you want to encourage. And this is why I think we need to have a long-term plan and we need to find a certain compromise that um, will take some of the poisonous momentum out of this issue uh, and will uh, pre present a vision for the f future that encourages, welcomes, creates legal pathways for all kinds of uh, immigration, not just of people to, you know, in the kind of lower end of health and aged care to help our aging population, but young people who want to be ent entrepreneurs, young people who've gotten graduate degrees. Yes, young people who are um, fleeing uh, horrendous circumstances, but we just cannot take in Europe or the United States all the people who would like to flee and might even have a legitimate asylum claim to flee the horrific human circumstances that they are facing. And therefore, if we don't have a foreign policy, if we don't have a forward-leaning aid policy that is going to uh, address the root conditions of these problems in Honduras, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in parts of Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in the Middle East, our good intentions are going to be overwhelmed. Thank you. Uh, questions? I'm going to be looking for hands. Uh, I can't actually see very well, but so there's a hand here in the middle. Oh, there's one over there. Okay. Um, my name is Borzun. and I'm a member of the community. Could, could uh, you speak up really? Hold yes. it very Maybe close. Stand can you hear me? So we can stand see up. You. Oh, okay. My name is Borzun, and I'm a member of the community. I listened with um, great interest to your comments, Larry, at the beginning when you spoke about this uh, universal perspective on um, global prosperity, that, that uh, decrease the tensions, the strife and suffering that um, was leading to migration. Uh, but then in your follow-on comments, your, your tone and perspective, to me at least, changed. You began to turn inwards. You, you spoke on behalf of the US about the limitations on which it could accept immigrants. You, you spoke um, with criticism about Angela Merkel's policies, and yet, um, as someone with your stature and your, um, the time that you've spent in studying uh, world governance and issues surrounding that, I'm surprised that you have not spoken about American policies which have led to a great many of these migration movements, the examples of which we can readily point to for the migration crisis in Europe, uh, the US policies that led to migration from North Africa to Europe, the US policies that led to the strife in the Middle East, not only in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Those are all related to US policies which in fact counter the advice and counsel that you were offering initially uh, in terms of improving global governance and prosperity that uh, disincentivize people's move towards uh, the developed world. So I'd like you to reconcile the disparity in the views that you've just described. Thank you. Larry? Well, uh, the problem is these are very tough choices. I think that um, it's easier to say that we should intervene before a state collapses or a regime falls to press for better governance, to not uncritically back a corrupt, uh, predatory, authoritarian regime, and to create the developmental conditions that will um, prevent the large-scale emergency flows of refugees and desperate people uh, that we've been referring to but when you've got an Arab Spring and people rise up in Syria, for example, which was a major, has been a major staggering source of emigration, what is the right policy? I, I actually think there's not an obvious answer to this. Um, 
I believed, and I still believe, that we should have um, done more to support the Syrian resistance early on. Uh, and I think if we had done that, um, uh, we might have gotten a different outcome early on before Syria became virtually uh, an occupied co country of Russia uh, and Syria, and the civil, civil war ground on uh, as it has. But I don't have confidence that that would have created uh, a different outcome in terms of refugee flows, and I do have confidence that there's no possibility that we would get consensus on what I just said among uh, well-intentioned people in this room. Uh, I think we can say that the policy of supporting Saudi Arabia to bomb Yemen into smithereens uh, and intervene cynically in that civil war uh, has been a morally and geopolitically bankrupt policy. Uh, but, you know, even if it hadn't happened, was that going to stop Iran from intervening in Yemen? Uh, these are agonizing geopolitical problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you really want to address them uh, with a higher degree of confidence, you have to intervene early on so you don't have such a disastrously badly governed state as Syria or Yemen that's highly prone to fail in the first place. Thank you. Uh, th I, there's a gentleman, I think it's a gentleman right here in the middle. And then over here in the aisle. Act actually, I'm feeling very threatened because I'm one of those gray hairs in the audience. And Jack, you've scared me about my future. <laughs> but before that time, please, I have a question to all four of you. You talk about the problem of failure to prepare. I'd like you each to comment on the role of education in the United States. Education starting with the lower grades and going through all of our education process, not just on an issue, but the education process. And please, if each of you will comment. Thank you. Did you each hear the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Mo, why don't you go first? Well, I think almost anybody our age said it's really a lot worse than when we were young. Uh, and I mean, the, I think the single thing that dismays me the most is simply the lack of historical knowledge on the part of students. And I mean, I, having seen my own kids go through schools, they don't do survey courses anymore. They do units on particular things. And there are just so many gaps in their, their knowledge background. It's hard to lecture to undergraduates because you assume certain things are universally known and it turns out they aren't. So, I mean, I think, I think there's lots of problems with education, but that would be the one I'd point to. Alice. When it comes to climate change, uh, I think the challenge with our educational system is uh, reflected in our major universities. We're very siloed. Uh, so the engineers aren't talking to the architects as much as we need, uh, and then the policy folks aren't talking to those uh, who are being educated in engineering. And so we get a lot of poor choices. And then you add on the fact that most of the people in charge do have gray hair. And I'll just ask you, for those of you who are a baby boomer or uh, older, how many of you had any education in climate change? One per, a uh, few hands. Well, people with gray hair, the baby boomers are in charge now and they have virtually no education, no continuing education, nothing being taught in a serious way, and this includes on public health, medical schools, about the real risks that are, have already emerged of, in climate change. Uh, that is true. Okay, well. Yeah, that's true. Wait, 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 wait. That, was the, that is, that is, that didn't happen, but I can tell you that we are not educating currently in any systematic way our engineers, our architects, our nurses to recognize the threats that they are currently having to plan for. It's just not happening. There aren't the tools available to do it, and there aren't honestly the skills uh, developed yet. So. We all assume, oh, of course somebody must be planning for that. It's just not happening. 
and you can go talk to uh, really uh, continue at American Society of Civil Engineers. They say it'll be 10 years before we have building standards that reflect the risks from climate change. That's their estimate. There are no current building codes that reflect the future risk. California has one of the best wildfire codes adopted in 2008. McClatchy just did a study, 350 homes built to that new standard. Good news. 50% of the homes survived the fire. Only 14% built to the old standards survived, but that's a 50% survival rate. And then you have insurance companies who may well decide, I don't want to insure this risk anymore. So you will have all those homes, even if they're built to the, largest, the best code now, that have a flip of a coin as to whether they're the winner or the loser. And who's going to pay? Those homeowners are going to want somebody to help them. You're hearing from Paradise right now. And then Paradise, not proven yet, but their water system may have melted because we used plastic piping. Uh, 300 million. If that's true, who's going to pay? We're going to have more fires, more infrastructure failures. And we're not training, so this is my education piece, we're not training the future decision makers and the current decision makers on how to make wise decisions now that will protect us in the foreseeable future. So Jack and Larry, I'm going to ask you to make two quick statements, and then we're going to go to the gentleman who is here on the aisle. It's not just education, although there are issues. It's a lack of demand for truth in our public discourse that I think is our biggest concern right now. People know that there is a problem with the climate. They're not, you know, they're not being told how severe the problem is, how rapidly it's accelerating, uh, and they're willing to accept reassurance. Uh, with population, a lot of people fear, you know, what's the Muslim population of the United States? Is it up to 10%? Is it up to 20%? It's 3%, but we don't demand that people tell us the truth and punish them for misleading us. Um, if that value gets entrenched, we can build on good education. But if we don't insist on truth in public discourse, education won't help. Larry? Go ahead. Oh, you're not going to say. Uh, I think we've We've done that. That's fine. <laughs> um, what? No, no, this gentleman here Sorry. right behind you. Sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for... Uh, great discussion. Um, I heard the word political will a few times, and you can't see it, but way above your head is the word governance. And when you study um, decision-making process, and when you study all behavioral economics, you learn that people are not always logical, and the quality of the decision has a lot to do with the decision-making process, the governance system, more you're talking about it in some, some of your paper. And in some extent, we are looking at the, it's not the issues of what should be on immigration or any other specific decision. It's the fact that the decision-making process seems to be broken. If we look globally, the country that's leading the world in dealing with climate change is China. If we look at the ability of a country to actually lead and make decision, it's China. If we now want to think about governance, the question, question is what can we do, and in two dimensions. In the US, we have Pete Buttigieg talking about before we get into policy, we need to change decision-making process, everything from gerrymandering to electoral college to Supreme Court reform. Do you agree with those, or do you have any other suggestion, better ideas on how to fix governance in the US? And the second question is, outside of the US, in the countries that are still same, like Canada, New Zealand, how can they vaccinate themselves and improve their governance so they will not be exposed to the same nationalism, populism, fake news uh, that we are seeing inflicting the US and many European countries? Would anyone I'm like to? I have trouble hearing the question. I, I had I, trouble hearing the questions. My hearing is not what it used to be. I think he was um, talking about no. that in order to, we need to look at the process of decision making, not 
the decisions yet, but the process of how we come up with decisions, that that is one of the things we need to, to change. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean if, if you had a, an authoritarian system and you convince the ruler that these things need to be done, it's a lot easier to do it, assuming you can get the population not to revolt, than in a democracy like ours, especially we have a, one of the world's more responsive democracies in terms of listening to people, giving people opportunity after opportunity to make their voices heard. And there are just also just some real problems in a democratic system, like you're asking people to make sacrifices in the here and now mm -hmm. for benefits that are far in the future. And so they're, they're nebulous to a certain, and we all have discount rates, and so that's one problem. The other problem is simply they're distributive, that if we do, okay, let's, let's move away from fossil fuels, there are a whole lot of people who get put out of work, whose livelihoods and communities are destroyed. And uh, what, one of the th comments in France with Macron's diesel tax was Macron is worried about the end of the world, we're worried about the end of the month. You know, and, and so, I mean, I mean, it's just, these are certain really severe problems inherent in democratic decision making, have, being in a democracy, but frankly, I'd, I'd rather work through them than live in a society like China. So yeah. I've neglected just, this side, so there are two yeah. people over here that I would, uh, this gentleman in the back, and then this will be our last question. Thank you very much. Uh, my impression from listening is that you've identified a massive number of very important problems. And uh, being brief here, you have used the mantra that we have to do something about them. We have to get together and get somebody from ethics and history and engineering and so forth and do something. Uh, I would like to ask, since you represent the experts, why the hell don't you say something really specific? I mean, you know, if it's a political problem, say you gotta learn to teach them how to vote, or something, which is something that makes us walk out of here feeling that the thinking you've done is not simply questions of problem, at which we, uh, I actually think the public is aware of the problem, particularly uh, the problem you talked about of, of, of the rising temperatures and so forth. But, but, but you know, we need you, to, experts, to sit down and identify mechanisms that would be needed and set, in a, set a pattern so that the, it, there's some consequence of it. I mean, this is diarrhea of the mouth. No, that's very good. I, well, Larry uh, has a, would uh, like There to. was something I wanted to say in response to the last speaker, and it's also quite relevant to the question you're posing now. Um, and it's really the meta issue of our broken political process. Um, we can't get responsible policy on uh, climate change, on immigration, on uh, the issue that we were also speaking about earlier that Jack raised, which is intergenerational fairness and the approaching uh, fiscal insolvency of social security and so on for several reasons. Yes, the trade-off between the immediate and the future uh, that Mo was just speaking of is, is an ever-present one. But another is that we increasingly have a Congress, Mo showed a slide, there are many such slides, in which there's just no overlap between Republicans and Democrats at all. And really, all of the practical political incentives are not to compromise, not to cooperate. And the reason is that um, candidates for Congress, for governor and so on, are nominated in low turnout partisan primaries where the uh, uh, incentive is to appeal, appeal to increasingly mobilized uh, ideological constituents who turn out in these primaries. And then that's the only choice the voters have in November because we have a first past the post system. I think if you adopt ranked choice voting as the state of Maine just did after its second effort to beat down the two party oligopoly in Maine uh, and, and defend the original referendum they had passed, uh, if you adopt ranked choice voting, you're gonna make it possible for more, uh, more creative opportunities to emerge. Uh, independents, uh, libertarians, greens, whatever, uh, and have an opportunity to present themselves to the voters without asking the voters to risk, in their minds, wasting their vote on a spoiler. If their first candidate doesn't make it and no one wins a majority, their vote will be transferred to their second choice. If you then also eliminate the sore loser rule, which keeps a uh, 
uh, an incumbent, for example, who's lost a party primary, like Lisa Murkowski in Alaska, who's one of the more moderate Republican senators, from being on the ballot in the general election and coming back and running as an independent to defend her decision to be more moderate and compromising, I think you will see more cooperative and compromising behavior in the Congress. I have met many members of Congress. They're actually pretty good people who are trapped in a very bad system of polarizing incentives in order to be reelected. And I believe if you change the incentives, we will get better policy. And I think that's what you are asking for. We're going to take a little break to Secretary Schultz. I'm supporting, and I invite you to join me in supporting an organization called With Honor. And we support That's veterans. That's another good one. We don't care whether Republicans or Democrats. If they're veteran, we support them. Why? Because a veteran has served, often under severe circumstances. It's in their DNA. I'm here to serve the country. That's what they're about. They've also been on a team. You know very well if you're in a combat situation or otherwise, it's not just you. You're a team. And if people do their jobs right, you'll succeed, only because it's a team. And that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything, but you, you work like a team. So we get people in office that have that DNA of, I'm here to serve the country, and have the experience of working with people as a team to get something accomplished. Maybe we'll get something done. So uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, so I apologize to this gentleman here. <laughs> but uh, I do want to thank our, our scholars and practitioners and speakers here today. And I especially want to thank Secretary Schultz for convening these now 11 uh, sessions and to the gentleman in the back about solutions. Uh, as George pointed out to us earlier, it isn't the federal government or it, we can all participate in this. So every one of you should um, keep asking questions. There are, will be more of these. Get educated and start interacting with all of us on an everyday basis. Thank you very much.